Okay, so I have explained this before, but since Darren is here, I'm going to back up just for a minute um, because, Darren, I love you, and you're going to find this very amusing. So we start off the calendar year. Christian calendar year starts with Advent, right? Last Sunday, November, we go through an Advent process. You have Christmas, and then you have the Epiphany season, and the Epiphany season leads to Lent. So there's five Sundays in Lent that take you to Palm Sunday. So, scripturally, if you look at that transition from Epiphany, the transfiguration of Jesus, to Palm Sunday, and you try to like find that in Matthew and Mark and say, what happened between here and here? You know how we do that kind of stuff? All right, so in uh, Matthew 17, I believe. 17 is the transfiguration. So, he, after the transfiguration, he cast out the demon... We didn't cover that one during Lent, but then there's like rank in the kingdom. There's stumbling blocks. There's discipline in prayer. There's all these things that we've covered, but in both the Matthew and the Mark um, of what happens between those two events, there's this one big, huge chapter on divorce, and I read through it, and I read through it, and I read through it, and I thought, okay, Lord, I'm, I, I, I got to preach on it. So there must have been a memo that went out and said tonight was the night that we were talking about, or is there final four basketball games on? And it's raining? All right, yeah, okay. All right, so if I say this, finish, finish it for me. For every dark cloud, there's... Okay, do you trust me? Can I get to the silver lining at the end of this sermon? Okay, we're going to do that. Uh, I'm in Matthew 19, and if you don't have a Bible, I have one for you. Not this one, a different one. Matthew 19, anybody need one? Hey, Adam, there's a, there's a box of Bibles. Lucas, yep, you know where you're at. Anybody else need them? What's, just one. Oh, I can't wait to tell people you came to church without a Bible. Man, I'm going to tell that story. That is going to be, Rebecca, that's going to be such a good story. <laughs> All right, Matthew 19, I'm going to start in verse 3. It says, Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? The question the Pharisees ask, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he, meaning Jesus, answered and said, Have you not read? That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two, two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So they asked the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his life for any reason at all? I'm in construction. And we have different types of questions. And there's times where I tell my young people th th that work, and I'll ask them a question, and they'll start on the, and wait, ah, it's a yes or a no question. <laughs> so they asked the question. Now, luckily, they didn't have the, the foolishness to say to Jesus, ah, it's a yes or no question, because Jesus went on one of those soliloquies. So they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he says, do you not remember your roots? Do you re not remember what God said to man way back in the Adam and Eve days that Moses recorded in the Pentateuch that all of you Pharisees have memorized? Otherwise, you wouldn't be Pharisees. And they ask him a follow-up question in verse 7. They said, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? In other words... They already kind of knew the answer when they asked the question to begin with. So they said, why didn't Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce in her way? And he said, because of your hardness of heart. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So I want to pause right there for a minute 
because when they ask him the question, Jesus takes them back to Genesis. So I want to go back to Genesis. So let's go back to Genesis 2. Dare, Genesis is the first book of the Bible, in case you weren't clear on where that is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll look in your table of contents first. I know you've been on sabbatical for a while, so, you know, I don't know how much Bible reading you're doing out there. <laughs> Darren's a pastor, a friend of mine, so, yeah, I'm teasing him. So Genesis 2, 18. I'm going to start in Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. I just got to segue just for a minute. I've missed out on the best job I could have ever had, a job that Adam Taylor made for me. I should have been the guy who names hurricanes. I should have been that guy. You would have had like the Avenger set of hurricanes that came through. You would have had like the, ex, the professional wrestler set of hurricanes that came through. So Adam was that guy. The Lord created creatures. Uh, Brontosaurus? Yeah, that's a good one. Write it down. I mean, he got to name all of those things. How cool is that? All right, verse 20. The man gave names to all the cattle, the birds, Beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place, and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, now, why did he bring her to the man? What was the man doing? Say it again. He was naming things. So, okay, here's the next thing I've created. Bring it to the man. The man says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24 says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. So what I, I love the story, the whole naming of the animals is completely not the point of where we're going today. But what I love about uh, wh what we want to pull out of this passage was in verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And I'm going to make him a helper suitable for him. And then in verse 24, this helper made suitable for the man is further described by saying, for this reason, because man should not be alone, a helper suitable. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So when the Pharisees asked Jesus, hey, is it okay they can send their wife away for any reason? He takes them back to this. He takes them back to remind them, hey, it isn't good for a man to be alone. Hey, a man needs a helper because even though I'm God and I created something that's perfect, I created you with the need that you couldn't do it on your own, you're going to need a helper. And I create it in such a way that they're good, you're going to be part of each other in, in a way that after thousands and thousands and thousands of years, mankind's still trying to figure out what that means. Still trying to figure out what that marriage union means. Still trying to figure out what becoming one flesh means. Now what's interesting to me about Genesis 2 and how Jesus takes the Pharisees back to Genesis 2 is that right there, right off the bat, in verse 18, the Lord God says, I need to make him a helper. Can you pull up, uh, uh, Lucas, can you pull up our first reading for tonight, Psalm 121? Do, 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 do. There we go. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? Don't, don't, don't stand. Go back. From where shall my help come? Well, according to Genesis 2, it's going to come from the woman. Right? Right? Okay. Verse 2. 
My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Okay, wait, stay right there. All right, I, I can concede that. It's somewhat semantical. The Lord created the woman, so technically the Lord's still the creator of. So, all right, go to verse 3. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Keep it rolling. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. That's good. I didn't see anything there about women. Huh. Is the Bible contradicting itself? Is it saying one thing in Genesis 2 and saying something else in Psalm 121? It, did, did Jesus not refer back to Psalm 121 at the question by the Pharisees? Because uh, is there symbolism here that we need to capture? Go to John 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, dear. John 14. John 14, I'm going to be in verses uh, just 16 and 17. 16 and 17, I got red letters in my book, which means Jesus is speaking. And he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides or lives with you and will be in you. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Like since Genesis 2, another helper? So mankind's getting another helper? Like since Genesis 2, another helper? It's interesting to me that when God created man and put man in the garden, that God's that the responsibility that God gave man in the garden was to cultivate the ground. It was to work the soil. It was to take. It was to administrate God's creation and to procreate and fill the earth. And there wasn't a suitable helper for that. So he created woman. Woman's job in this is to partner with man in order to take care of the tasks and the responsibilities that the Lord has placed on mankind in the earth that, the man, that, that God created. Now, if the two of you become one flesh, or as I like to say it in weddings, what was now two is now one. So the two of you is now one of you. In other words, my wife and I are a team. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not over her. She's not over me. We're a team. So we have a line of responsibilities that we divide out. And my wife and I like to laugh that if people looked into our life about how we do checkbooks and how we pay bills and how we kind of administrate all of those things, we do all the wrong things according to the Christian people. We don't do it correctly. Like, but it works for us. We have a division of responsibilities. She clicks off hers. I can't really snap on that one. And I click off mine, and it works okay. There are things that I am certainly would, would hold up the world that the man of the house would make that decision. But there's things where she makes the decision because she's the woman of the house. And frankly, the man of the house doesn't have a clue how that part of the house works. So the two of us have become one of us in a sense that I don't make any decisions. She doesn't make any decisions that doesn't affect the other one. So as we think about and administrate the life and the responsibilities given to us by the Holy Spirit, we're constantly banging it off of each other. Here's this. Here's this. What should we do? What do you think? Let's pray about it. We should read. Hey, have you read that? Blah, 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 blah. Why? Because it's one of us. Now, I may stand up here, but I don't stand up here without her. And the things that she does, which would be very too numerous to list right now, she doesn't do without me standing up here and being on my knees for her. Does that make sense? Not only is she my helper, I am her helper. 
Woman is the symbolic relationship of God with man because man needs a helper. Psalm 121 is absolutely accurate. My help comes from the Lord and the woman created for the man is to get the man to understand you were never created to do it alone. You were always created to be in concert with something else. The physical reality of that is the marriage union. Paul talks about in Ephesians 5. He talks about the relationship between man and wife and the relationship between the church and Jesus as being the same thing. Being the same thing. So, <clears throat> the woman represents God. And our marriage represents our relationship with God. Now, when I say the woman represents God, the two of you become one of you, which means this can flip. So I can say to the women, your husband represents God. In the sense that your relationship with him represents your relationship with God. In other words, God gave us something physical that we can see, hear, taste, and touch. That we can live in and live out of. Uh, do well and do poorly. And what it represents is this relationship. My wife and I call it, uh, we, we talk about it far, in the terms of a cruciform relationship. We have this vertical relationship with God that impacts the horizontal relationship that we have with the world around us. Specifically, this horizontal relationship. That if she's digging after the Lord, and I'm digging after the Lord, and we're climbing that vertical ladder, staircase, whatever, if we're climbing that, our horizontal relationship with each other is much better. Where it gets worse is when she's digging, it and I'm watching Sports Center. And she wants to talk to me about Job, and I'm like, hey, did you see who scored tonight? That's crazy. That's wild. Look at this. Wait, honey, look at this. We're farther apart. For us, for mankind, <coughs> whether we be man or woman, it's not good for us to be alone. Now, when the Bible uses the word alone, it's really talking about the word lonely, okay? So there's a difference in, in English language. There's a difference between spending alone time. You've heard me say many times you need to spend some alone time. And being lonely. Being lonely is this place of seeking something that you know not, and the walls of depression are starting to move. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Right? You guys remember that? So... <clears throat> Being alone is okay. Being lonely is not a good thing. Now, when the Bible talks about alone, it means the lonely. So for us, for man, for woman, it is not good for us to be lonely. And we all need a helper to love, to laugh, to live. Any of those cliche things are all accurate. And our union with the Holy Spirit, our, our union with God himself is Two becoming one. Everybody with me? That makes sense? Okay. So back to the original question. Why does God hate divorce? God hates divorce because God hates anything that brings violence against the union of love. No matter what it is. Divorce is the ultimate act of violence against the physical thing that God instituted that is conjoining to explain this relationship. If we didn't have any inkling of this, we would never get that. Never get it. It would be so far above our pay grade, we would never understand it. Why does God hate divorce? When, when this becomes okay, then this doesn't seem like a big deal. It's interesting, when I go back to Matthew 19 and I look at the words that Jesus said, <clears throat> they ask him that follow-up question. 
okay, Lord, all that you said about Genesis 2, okay, that's really good. Yeah, we're Pharisees. We remember that now. So then why did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce or him a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus responds, because of your hardness of heart. Because you're unwilling to accept it as I've created it. Because you're unwilling to play by my rule. You've got to do it your own way. You know that free will thing when we were talking about it up in heaven way back. Ah, you were unwilling. So here's the clause. So within the church, from that day until this day, when is divorce permitted? Immorality. Immorality, unfaithfulness. Wait a minute. If we're the bride and Jesus is the groom and divorce is permitted in the case of unfaithfulness or immorality, does that mean we can be divorced? Does that mean Jesus can divorce us? Let's go to Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah 3. Darren, that's after Psalms and Proverbs. Be like to the right of that, right after Isaiah. Jeremiah 3. In verse 6, the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what faithless Israel did? Now, at this time, uh, the Hebrew people was divided into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. They went by the names Israel and Judah, okay? So in this passage, you're going to hear two things. Israel and Judah, collectively, they're all the Hebrew people. Everybody halfway clear? Okay. Uh, have you seen what faithless Israel did? This is the Lord speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. She, meaning Israel, went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. Are we starting off good or are we starting off bad? We're starting off bad. I thought, meaning the Lord, I thought after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. Historically speaking, the Lord caused another country to take over Israel and take them captive. That was his writ of divorce. In other words, I am removing my protection from you, and you're going into captivity. That's scary stuff. I'm going to keep reading. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land, committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception. And the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. In other words, let me put that in some better English. Faithless Israel, despite the fact that I gave her a writ of divorce, at least she was evil honestly. Judah had the nerve to come to the sanctuary and pretend to be religious. And the Lord said, faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, toward Israel. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree. You have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless sons, 
for I am a master to you, and I will make you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart and will feed you on knowledge and understanding. I love the end of verse 12. I will not be angry forever. How many of you had a mama, a grandmama, somebody who used to say, child, when you get mad and you want to say something, you need to count to 10 or a teacher. I, I think about that. How long was the captivity? Do you remember the, the, the Babylonian captivity was? Babylon? Yeah. Wasn't it 70 years? Th this, this context. The writ of divorce to Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. That was Judah. So the Babylonian captivity had a time limit. Do you remember what it was? I'm trying to remember what the years were. Okay. I think it's 70 years. I think because it was prophesied that way. You would be in a Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Are you giving me thumbs up? 70 years? Okay. So the writ of divorce that the Lord gives to Israel was 70 years. So when my mom would say, hey, John, you need to count to 10. When your steam comes up, you need to count to 10. This is the equivalent of the Lord counting to 10, but his 10 was 70 years for them to get it before they got faithful enough to come back. So, I will not be angry forever is the good news. So the questions for us in 2019 when it comes to the divorce, this is something the church has been dealing with for a long time. Can Christians come back from divorce to this, to this covenantal place, to this, to this love of God? Well, according to the book, yes. God isn't going to be angry forever. God does not like divorce because divorce wrecks this, this, uh, this love and this union with him. But it doesn't mean that repentance doesn't count. It doesn't mean you can't come before the throne. It doesn't mean divorce is not the unforgivable sin. You can come back from this. Can Christians come back from divorce to a covenantal place of love with God? And the answer to that is you betcha. You betcha. And all glory be to God on that. Lord in heaven, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I'm thinking about my own life. And I know that I am guilty of things that have wrecked the love in the union of marriage. Lord, parts of my life, times of my life, I've done my best job of trying to tear apart what you put together. <laughs> 